Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar, which is a third in a new series hosted by the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty on the Key Success Factors in Addressing Jewish Poverty. The National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty is a collaborative of funders, Jewish federations, direct service providers, researchers, media outlets, and advocates dedicated to fighting poverty in the American Jewish community. In this series, we will highlight specific case studies and bright spots from throughout North America, with a particular focus on meeting the enormous challenges posed by the COVID pandemic and its economic effects. Future sessions will explore issues of measurement evaluation, landscape analysis, awareness building, virtual program delivery and convening. We also had uh, programs on advocacy and small Jewish communities. Um, and they are all on Thursdays from 12 to 1. The next is February, February 18th, and the next one after that is March 4th. So please look out for our website or look out for our newsletter for more information and the registration links. But today in this session, we are really excited to, to dive deeper into engaging people with lived experience in our work. And I will now hand it over to a moderator, Susan Ditkoff of the Bridge Fan Group Boston, who will frame the conversation and introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, Tamar. Welcome, everyone. Um, as Tamar mentioned, this is a, a one webinar in a series that are all thinking about the broad frame of Jewish poverty and the broad moment that we're in uh, post in COVID and sort of ho hopefully soon to be post COVID moment, um, but how Jewish poverty in particular has disproportionately affected um, different groups of individuals within our community. Um, and so this series of webinars is really looking at different kinds of ways to um, what, what best practices look like, if you will, at a, at a very broad level. Um, things like engaging in advocacy, things like rethinking program delivery to be in a virtual environment, um, rethinking how decisions get made, how we think about the demographics of our community, how we think about um, even, even things like evaluation. A lot of those things are getting rethought. Um, and one really important piece of that puzzle is who is at the table. Um, and I think for some people, this is a uh, a newer conversation and for other people it's a conversation they've been in for quite a long time. Um, so I just, one metaphor that always resonates for me when I got into this work a few years ago um, was the idea of, you know, the sort of the, the two fish in a fishbowl um, walking along in their fish, fish way um, and another fish swims by and said, how's the water? And the fish keeps swimming and the one fish says to the other one, what's water? Um, at what's water? And so there's something that's really powerful about the, the culture, the context, the, the patterns um, that we live in that are created by different systems and structures around us that we might not even see the water around us. Um, and so part of this session in particular is really sort of pulling back and thinking as holistically as possible about who, uh, how, how do we think about inclusion as holistically as possible? How do we think at who's at the table, whose voices are being heard, who's missing? Um, and how do we think about sort of the effects of individual action uh, specifically in relationship to systemic action? So that all sounds a little bit vague, um, but we started with this idea of you know, engaging people who have lived experience in the process of um, service delivery, um, program design, resource allocation. Um, so not only identifying folks and not only asking for their opinions in, in focus groups or interviewing them about what they might think is important of priorities, but actually bringing them in and into a, a table that um, is a much, a much different way to think about a table um, for all of us. Uh, so, and, 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 and by extension, how the table needs to be different um, in order to encompass a, a much wider um, lens for everyone. Um, as we make decisions. So to that end, um, we've sort of broadened the frame from just including people with lived experience. Um, and we have three terrific people to help us sort of think through this journey. Um, we have Yavila McCoy, who is the CEO and Executive Director of Dimensions. We have Lani Santo, who's the CEO of Footsteps. And we have Edith Klein, the President and CEO of Keshet, um, LGBTQ Equality and Jewish Life. 
So let me pause there um, and I'm gonna, we'll, we'll do the format that we'll follow is that we'll hear a little bit from each of our panelists um, about how they see these questions about what does a vision look like of, of true inclusion? How do we get there? What do we need to unlearn? Um, and how do we think about the COVID moment in particular? And um, we'll then move later on into in some version of, of all of those um, in different, uh, different uh, titrations. Uh, then we're going to move to a question of what is it the, the role of philanthropy can play, um, which is sort of a key theme in all of these webinars, um, given that it's part of the uh, National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty and sponsor, this is sponsored by the, the Jewish Funders Network. So with that, and then obviously please do, we, there's a, the chat is open, um, Q&A is open, so please feel free to write in questions um, and we look forward to, to the conversation. So Vivil, if I can ask you to start off, um, that would be great. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good to be here. Um, thanks to Mar and Susan for having me and thanks Lonnie for having the wisdom to invite me to partner with you here. Um, I'll start uh, pretty much with the fact that I'm the CEO of Dimensions Educational Consulting, but what's important to know about my personal and professional orientation to the work of poverty is that we're organized as a majority black women's led organization. And we provide educational resources to the community around racial equity, and we do community development resources for historically marginalized and under-resourced communities, primarily Jews of color. So my work and my personal life is um, animated by these issues. And if I were to tell you personally where I'm implicated by poverty, it's that my family actually came to Brooklyn post the Great Migration um, from the South due to um, their need to escape terrorism in the Jim Crow South. And they came up to Brooklyn seeking opportunity. And so when my great grandmother first got to Brooklyn, she worked in a laundromat. Weinberg laundromat, a Jewish laundromat as a laundress, and my other great grandmother worked as a maid in the Jewish household. So my relationship to this work as a Black Jew is both um, on at the intersection of poverty as a laborer and a domestic worker in Jewish households, possibly that had escaped similar conditions coming from Europe. So that's super important to know about how we are come from in terms of this work. The other thing that is important to know is that there's a vision that I hold as a Jew of color for what thinking about poverty might hold because of the journey that I've come from. Um, one is to think about the vision as preserving human dignity in our approach. So because I had the gift of being able to receive a Jewish education, three generations after my great grandparents were laborers in Jewish households, my mindset is of Shiviti Hashem Lenegdi Tamid. May I always know that before me in all humanity is a vision of God. And that there, as my great grandmother continued to teach across generations, there but for the grace of God go I. I am not looking at somebody who needs to be saved. I'm looking at somebody who could be me, if not for generational um, changes in who we are. So those are two things that ground my mindset today as I think about poverty and interventions to poverty. But there's also this idea of what I learned as a yeshiva girl about what, how we approach poverty. The idea of community as a set table, the idea of truma and maser and yovel, that poor people didn't have to build a bridge in order to cross it. They could walk into our fields and get what they need because it was already set there. The way our systems and structures for wealth sustained a whole preset that never worked because their service to the community was already rewarded by our economic structures and systems. Ways in which we sustain inequality by not creating interventions that are normative. This is something that I think about when I think about a vision for what we could do better on. And there's a way in which if we think about setting the table, there's a way in which there are, our services should be on pay scales, ways in which folks should not have to ask for a scholarship, ways in which folks should not have to seek out resources. They should already be laid out by saying all of us should be thinking about economics when we go to approach any door and that the right size scale for us is already placed within the system for onboarding. Um, thinking about the Jewish connection questions, I'm wondering about staff and leadership and how we're trained and how we are 
taught to understand implicit bias in the context of the way we approach the poor and the working class and wondering about whether we think about the ways in which our assumptions are that people are already at a state of resilience in the context of their work and that possibly their poverty is due to temporary mean straits as opposed to ongoing um, need to survive chronic and transgenerational poverty conditions that are a result of chronic and ongoing systemic inequality. So I would just say that it's super important in terms of our culture and our approach and our mindset to see that poverty itself is not siloed, that poverty is just as systemic and structural as wealth itself. Wealth, it has systemic structures that keep it in place and so does poverty. And so to come at that enterprise with humility and an understanding that when we come to address the social good, we're talking about housing, we're talking about schooling, we're talking about safety, we're talking about health, we're talking about health care, we're talking about immigration, we're talking about immigration and sovereignty and citizenship, we're talking about dignity, and we're talking about humanity itself. So those are all things that are super important in terms of mindset and culture, in terms of what philanthropist needs to know. I want philanthropists to be aware of statistics and data. I want us to be thinking about through COVID, we're talking about a black community where people, children under six are three times more likely to go hungry and be in poverty than their peers in broader society. What is that? What is that implication for our Jewish community? We're looking at that coming out of the last recession, the net worth of black families was $4,900 compared to $97,000 for white families and their counterparts. We're looking at if current trends continue into 2053, the median income of Latinx and Black families is due to go down to zero, while white American households are now projected to own 86 times more wealth than African American households and 68 times more wealth than Latino households. If we think about that in terms of our proximity to those realities, we're looking at a philanthropy sector that has 40% of our working population being BIPOC people of color and less than 10% of those people being on boards and less than that percent as CEOs or board chairs. So if we're not proximate to these realities and yet we are decision makers, we run the risk of engaging in direct service out of relationship with the people that we're trying to serve. We run the risk of tokenizing our proximity to that by only having one door to go through in which to get information and waiting for a pipeline to develop in order for us to even know who the communities are while not assuming that there are organic remedies that people have been living for through with over generations in order to survive. Are we investing in creating that table by seeing the people we have not seen and investing in experiences we have not yet had opportunities to do while not devaluing the work that is already being done by these people to save themselves. So COVID, here we are. Let me that those will be my last comments here. COVID, I had a staff in which on my staff and dimensions, black women led organization. Um, every single member of my staff was impacted directly in their families by COVID, yet facing a community that organized millions of dollars around resource and then as an afterthought came looking for Jews of color communities and what they could do to support. So internally, we had to create our own mutual aid society. Internally, we had to create micro communities for support. Internally, we had to do national organizing as an organization that was not funded at the outset to do so. As a result, my staff was exhausted my staff lived through situations of loss of family, of death, of having to run to the bedsides of people who were in ICU in Michigan, of living through the economic and the, the, the environmental crisis in California. We were triple threat throughout COVID because of the intersection of race and class and things like lack of health care, things like the inability to be able to have mental and emotional and physical resilience through this time impacted our community greatly. So there are things we have to look at. There are ways of being that we have to explore. As philanthropists, there's lots that I think we can be curious about, but for sure we should not ignore the historical and politi political significance of the moment that we're in and reach for each other so that whatever the story of poverty is going into the future, it's one that acknowledges how did we get here and how is that informing the story of how we go forward. Thank you. Vivila, thank you so much. That was a, a fantastic introduction um, to sort of set the set the stage. Um, and just one other thing that your remarks made me think of. Um, 
the Bridge Band Group did a study recently with Cheryl Dorsey of Echo and Green and did some work on, in the general nonprofit sector, um, disparities in funding leaders of color in nonprofit organizations. Um, and of course, there are disparities um, with Black CEOs um, in the and people of color in the uh, general for-profit sector and the private sector, um, but the disparities in the nonprofit sector are pretty extraordinary also. Um, the, for example, the unrestricted net assets of Black-led organizations are 76% lower um, than those of white-led organizations. Unrestricted net assets being kind of a lifeblood um, to some extent of, of organizations. Um, and the average revenues are 25% lower um, when you correct for everything else. And so um, clearly those disparities, there's a lot more data if anyone's interested, I'm happy to bring some of it back in, but but the disparities and the sort of the clarity of the, of the data and looking at that and saying that's, you know, it, it may feel one way, uh, but looking at that information and, and cognitively um, trying to process it and figure out what to do about it is is a very um, uh, is parallel activity, important parallel activity. So thank you, Yavila. Um, Lani, can you can you go next? Sure, sure. Um, I'm I'm not sure I'm going to hit on all of all of the big picture questions. Um, I think that. Um, Yavila set the stage beautifully for us on the systemic side of things. And um, where I want to start is a, is a bit about my journey in the last decade with Footsteps, um, which is an organization that supports and affirms individuals and families who are choosing to leave ultra-Orthodoxy in pursuit of a self-determined life. And um, to give some context, Footsteps um, has a multi-pronged approach to doing so. We have social service work housed alongside community building work, alongside field and movement building work. And so for us, that three-pronged approach is really important and mimics what we feel, you know, societally we should, how we should be engaging in um, social change and anti-poverty work that one feeds into the other so people might be coming for community because they feel incredibly isolated and alone. And then, and maybe in, in cases, COVID has shifted this, but in many cases not wanting to ask for help um, given the pride that's there. Um, and having the service provision right there allows people to come for community and stay for services. That's just one example of how important we've seen that as a model. And I think that, you know, when a, a few things that I want to raise up when I consider the question of um, having folks from lived experience, um, you know, being a part of the solutions. Uh, Footsteps was founded by a young woman named Malky Schwartz, who was of lived experience. She herself was fighting for the right to an education. Her immediate family did not let, um, was not supportive of that. And so she went to outsiders. She went to her, actually, they were her family, but they were outsiders to her, um, to her secular grandpa grandmother, her aunt, her cousins. And uh, it was that combination of insider outsider perspectives that has, that we've continued to um, hold throughout um, Footsteps existence. I think that what was uh, really difficult in the early years for Footsteps, um, when Malky was there was how how triggering it was for her and how how re-traumatizing it was for her to be serving people and working to meet a lot of different needs while she herself was going through a transition. So she smartly identified that she should not be doing everything and brought in a, like, you know, when we were no staff, it was it was Malky and a social worker. And I think that you know, some of that turned into over the years of, of her being her, there and after she left of, of the organization um, sort of sliding to a bit of a savior complex of, right, like there were amazing um, folks on the board who were part of the founding of the organization and supporters. Um, but part of what happens, and I, and I, and um, it struck me as I was coming from a human rights and anti-poverty background, in, um, in entering footsteps is that um, it was really, um, the, the lang even the language was a savior language of like, let's help those poor kids who need to get out of Williamsburg. And so a lot of the work that we've done over the years was to work on lifting up 
our members into leadership positions, one of the first things I did was uh, um, advocate for two um, folks of lived experience to be on our board. And we've expanded it six, since then to it's about 30% now. And I imagine it will shift over the years. Um, as staff has grown, we're about 40% um, folks lived experience on staff and in decision-making um, positions and leadership positions in the organization. Um, and, you know, for, I think that the, the balance is, is a tricky one for us. Um, and for me in particular, a little bit of, of my connection is also an insider outsider. I, I grew up um, in a modern Orthodox community, in a modern Orthodox family that was situated in an increasingly black hat Haredi community. And uh, uh, what, what that, you know, the, the veil of conformity in spaces like that was incredibly hard for me um, as I um, had uh, parents that were Bali Chuba who landed themselves in a community that they loved but struggled with the values on and had a mom that came out as gay and felt like I couldn't tell a soul for five years um, into, my, into my late teens. Um, and so, you know, while personally I did not grow up in the Friday community, growing up adjacent to it enough helps me um, understand and identify with the, the core aspects of people who are struggling for their rights to be heard, for their rights as individuals, and for their rights to self-actualize, um, and knowing how hard it is to feel alone and isolated. So, um, so I think that, you know, even when folks sort of toggle the line at footsteps is like, are they of lived experience or not? Even that, those questions of like, what is lived experience? We really look for different types of lived experience on our staff. And we want our staff to model, ideally, the diversity that's out there in the world that our members will start to interface with as they integrate into broader society. And so not only having folks who strongly understand what they're, what they're um, coming to them with, but also people who, you know, might have grown up in a restrictive Muslim environment or have an immigrant family from the Dominican Republic, like all of those are really important aligning um, factors and are different types of lived experience to bring to the table in informing our programs. I, I could say more, but I, I think that maybe I'll pause and leave. I imagine we'll come back to additional questions as we as we move forward. No, that's great, Lonnie. And so it really starts to sort of pull in some of the ideas of mindset, language, concrete examples of what um, true inclusion could look like. Um, I think sometimes people say, oh, we have a round table of beneficiaries that are informing our work. And that's better than not, but it's very different from having people who are in the decision-making roles um, about how things are gonna, or things are happening at the, at the board level and the leadership level. So, so thank you for that. That's some um, really great examples. Um, Edith, can we turn to you? Yes, thanks, Susan. Um, so thanks so much for inviting me to be part of the conversation. Thank you, Lonnie, for being the one to initially invite me alongside with you and Yavila, who are two of the Jewish leaders out there who um, I most admire um, and have for a long time. Um, so I come to this work um, as someone who immigrated to the United States as a very young person, I came as a toddler from Israel. Um, my parents were very poor. And so we moved into um, a, a poor neighborhood where there was a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment um, and where, um, you know, even though I and, and uh, my parents and my brother who came along later um, are white, um, we were very much um, as an immigrant family, we were very much racialized as non-white. Um, and uh, you know, and kind of looking back, I certainly didn't understand this at the time, but looking back, kind of that was my first introduction to, co first conscious introduction uh, to an experience of white supremacy, um, you know, in terms of, of the, you know, the, the, the way that I was experienced marginalization as an immigrant. Um, and when I think about our, our topic today and, um, and think about the time that we're living in, I think about, um, the ways in which in times of the kinds of social stress that we're living in now, um, we experience our societal pain points as exacerbated. And um, the upside is that they also become more visible or many of them become more visible. 
um, and therefore um, can potentially become more accessible to being engaged with in a meaningful way. So I think about at Keshet, um, we saw very dramatically from early on that there were young people who, um, because we had previously done 99% of our work with young people in person, around this, a little later than this time last year, when we, you know, as everybody else did, had to entirely reconfigure how we did things and started doing everything online, um, we started seeing a flood of young people join us online who, you know, were sheltering at home in situations that were the opposite of shelter, that were the opposite of protection. Um, we started seeing kids who, you know, were taking their computers into their closets in their bedrooms, putting ear pods in, chatting on Zoom and whispering for fear of their parents hearing them. You know, and, and we started hearing from kids, I've been wanting to go to a Keshet Shabbaton for five years, but my parents have never allowed me to go. You know, and you know, as time went on, you know, seeing how the layers of additional marginalized identity and experiences of oppression, whether it be queer young people who, you know, who are also kids of color and or are experiencing economic insecurity, you know, and or and or and or you know, experiencing the layers and layers of increased exacerbated vulnerability uh, and you know and you know and 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 isolation. Um, so that's been um, that's both been sad and and troubling to see. Um, and I thank God that we're seeing it in a much deeper way. Um, than we were actively seeing it before. Um, I feel like we don't often hear a lot about poverty and the LGBTQ community. Um, you know, and so I so I want to so I want to share some information to make sure that it's out there because you know of, of, because of course when people experience pervasive and persistent discrimination, um, they will experience um, an elevated vulnerability to economic insecurity. And again, when identity layers are piled on top of one another and someone is not only a transgender woman, you know, but also a black woman, you know, and also a woman with a disability, you know, then that vulnerability um, becomes more and more acute. You know, and so some things that we know, we know that one out of five LGBTQ people live in poverty. You know, by contrast to 16% of cisgender straight people, um, we know that 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 statistic um, increases dramatically when it comes to specifically transgender people. Over 30% of transgender people live in poverty, um, and then we know that those statistics skyrocket even more when we look specifically at the experiences of Black LGBTQ people. Um, over 30% of Black LGBTQ people live in poverty. Um, and so again, that contrasts to 16% of all straight cisgender people, and that contrasts to 25% of cisgender straight Black people. Um, and the last piece of data that, that I want to share that um, I think is really important for um, all of us in leadership and for anyone in philanthropy to be aware of is that over 40% of youth who are homeless now are LGBTQ, which is you know, just absolutely staggering. Um, for a lot of reasons, which is another philanthropic conversation, um, we have very little data about how any of this shows up within the Jewish world. Um, and, you know, and that's an area for further inquiry and, and investigation. And you know, past, um, past inquiry has shown that more often than not, the Jewish population mirrors these kinds of trends in the broader population. And certainly, um, you know, that is what we've seen, you know, at Keshet anecdotally looking specifically at the LGBTQ community. And so I would say, um, you know, when thinking about poverty, as, as Yavila powerfully said earlier, um, you know, approaching it from, um, from a sensibility that is about a commitment to dignity and seeing people's full humanity is critical, um, and it's critical. It's critical as Jews because it's in line with our values. It's critical also because we know that that is what's most effective. We know that that is actually the route um, to creating change and ultimately to eradicating poverty and you know and other systems of oppression. 
Um, and so looking at you know, who is involved in decision making um, and are is and and are you making sure, as Lani was discussing earlier and as Yavila was mentioning, are you making sure that the people who are most affected by wherever you want to invest your funds um, you know, are offering their perspectives and are helping to guide your decisions? Um, there's a, you know, a powerful slogan that has been around for many years that started in the disability rights music, uh, movement, um, nothing about us without us. Um, and many of our other movements have, have, have picked that up as well because it's something um, that resonates, that affirms people's sense of dignity and people's sense of, um, kind of enfranchisement and, you know, and, you know, and belonging. You know, and we know that you know, that is the way to most effectively create change. Good, okay. I think we've opened a lot of boxes and we've started uh, looking in them. So, so thanks to all three of you. Um, I just wanna remind folks to please feel free to start putting questions in the Q&A if you want. And thank you to those of you who've started putting things in the chat. Um, some really important sort of context and framing. Thank you, Edith, for the kind of that intersection of the LGBTQ world and poverty particularly, and that and some of those disproportionate effects um, and really helpful individual stories. It actually reminds me, and you'll be able to sort of evoke something you said as well, and something that we heard in a webinar a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about Jewish poverty in small communities, which is there's a lot of talk about stigma and dignity and how do we reduce stigma and that sort of thing. And one of the panelists then said, you know, what if we made it so that when we were creating a summer camp, nobody needed a scholarship because the starting entry price was something that everyone could do? What if it were a $5 a day day camp so that everyone could pay $5 a day and no one was in the position of having to ask for a scholarship? Um, it doesn't mean that everyone can pay $5 a day, but it just really broadens sort of the, the scope of what does it mean to be a community where from the outset, things are, you know, potluck, everyone brings something um, as opposed to expensive catered where you have to pay a lot of money to do things. And so how do you kind of separate some of the community experiences that everyone can participate in without feeling like they need something special, um, but just as a full member of the community. Um, so anyway, I think we, I think a lot of what you all said sort of revoke that in my mind. Um, and also just sort of what are some of those dominant narratives that we, that we need to let go of um, to move forward. Um, so I want to spend a couple minutes on philanthropy in particular. Um, you know, we know that there are barriers to capital um, when thinking about poverty, thinking about including people who are most proximate to an issue. Um, and so what I would love to hear is sort of your thoughts and, and stories of maybe how it worked well, or if there's a, um, I suppose you can name names or an anonymous example of things that, that didn't work, um, that would be really helpful because we know that at each stage of of the pipeline, you know, even just from the first outset of, you know, getting connected, people who are most proximate to issues don't necessarily have equitable access um, and social networks to people who are in the philanthropic community or even at the tops of some of our larger um, NGOs who are hoping to serve um, these groups um, in our community. Um, they don't necessarily have uh, a, a building of rapport. There's can there can be kind of interpersonal bias. There can be discomfort. You know, just, is this somebody that I would give money to because I feel comfortable with them? And you might not feel comfortable um, in in that moment um, because that's and that's part of the point that you know kind of leaning into that discomfort. I think we you know can we hear a lot, but that has sort of special sort of dynamics when we're talking about philanthropy. And then you know getting the trust, getting the you know is someone going to make a big bet on me um, when I don't look like them? I don't sound like them. I didn't go to the same schools. Um, and just what does that look like and feel like sort of down the road in that funding relationship where you really have to just do different work um, to, to create those connections. Um, and it's work that, that needs to get done. It's not sort of special work for certain people. It's just work that we all um, need to sort of think about, uh, again, to kind of end up with a community that's, that is fully inclusive. So at any rate, I would love to sort of pick up on some of the things that you guys started talking about and just the role of philanthropy in particular and you know, where does it work well, but also um, kind of what are things that you've noticed that, um, that are maybe things we have to unlearn. Um, so I'll, I'll open it up. I don't, we don't have a particular goal here, although Yavil, you are nodding. So um, if you want to start off, that would be great. Um, two weeks ago, I got a call from a Jew of color that was seeking resources, COVID resources that had been organized um, in one of our Southern cities. 
And she asked me, would you vouch for me on this application? Because in order to apply for resources, one of the questions is about my relationship. Like I have to give them a Jewish source of connection, um, a Jewish leadership connection. And it, I've been, you know, isolating in COVID over the past eight months. So not only do I not know anybody and not only do I not have a connection to a synagogue, but like, I don't know any Jewish leaders. Um, how am I supposed to fill out this application? So the assumptions people make about networks and connection, what you just said about getting connected can 100%, especially for Jews of color who may not live their most salient expression of their Jewish identity or culture with other Jews. Um, that could be a barrier. Um, that's one in terms of getting connected. And then the spaces in which we navigate to be able to talk about resource are often spaces where especially leaders of color or Jewish leaders of color have no access to. So it's not only just what happens when they get there, it's how well do they even know that the resource exists? So there's a, a next step, a, a negative one step in terms of how do we advertise? How, how do we create connection that allows people to even know where to find resources if we can't make assumptions about what Jewish identity and culture means for folks across racial and cultural and class lines? I'd love to comment on the access piece um, because it was something that was so, so hard for, um, you know, our founder, Malki, who I admire so much. And I, I, I don't know if footsteps would be in the same place as we are today, if um, we hadn't, you know, the board at the time hadn't made a decision to bring someone in that was somewhat of an outsider. And uh, that's really complicated. And that's not what we want to, for the future of leadership at Footsteps, right? Like I would hope that the, the next CEO, the next, you know, the like would be someone of lived experience. And uh, the fact that, the fact that the fact that like sometimes people are angrier really I think puts funders off like that they you know but the the anger is coming from a place of feeling really um not cared for and not heard and and like being okay when anger comes to the table and like um just getting to the source of it a little bit more I've over the years I've also sat at tables with colleagues who are of lived experience, um, talking to funders about our anti-poverty work. And then they'll start to ask them about their Jewish identity and how they practice, like sort of with the sense of like, well, if you're not engaged enough or practicing enough or affiliated enough for our bar here, like we're not gonna fund the, you know, career services, educational services, financial stability services that you offer. Um, that's like that's felt it feels very othering you know to have to to have to prove you know how jewish people are um when you're talking about anti-poverty work it shouldn't even really be a part of the conversation um and that's you know that's put uh, a number of folks off over the years and just like i think the other piece that has happened you know with with um you know who's at the table and who's not at the table with footsteps over the years is this fear of offending the Haredi community. And like, if we invest in footsteps, then our partners who are also, you know, providing services with and alongside ultra Orthodox individuals will see us as taking your side. And for us, like there's not sides in anti-poverty work. There's not sides in social justice work. And uh, to recognize that, you know, I, I, that, we have um, that if the Haredi community is the fastest growing segment of the Jewish community in North America and certainly in the, you know, in the Northeast and in, in the tri-state area, it's over 600,000 individuals, like that there's a natural attrition that's going to come from that, that's going to be growing and growing alongside just like more and more people who are leaving, who are vocal about the fact that they can't succeed, that will amplify it. And so like, these are folks that are coming that could be gems um, if, if, if brought in and if not asked, how are you practicing your Judaism? Like, or why aren't you conservative reform or X like me from a funder? And it's like, can we just talk about being human beings without those qualifications? And I, I think that that's 
one of the things that's really, really hard when it, when, you know, in terms of like seats at the table and how, how people feel when they're, you know, talking to, to funders about our work. Um, I want to bring in um, one other dynamic that, that I see frequently, which is that when, that often I see, particularly when it comes to kind of engaging with LGBTQ people, um, often an organization will decide that kind of it's time that they, you know, become more representative in their leadership um, and, you know, include people of all sexual orientations and gender identities. And so they'll just start to reach out to LGBTQ Jews in the community, um, you know, inviting people to engage and will kind of assume that a sense of belonging and a desire to invest exists and assume that that simple invitation, you know, that extension of a seat at the table kind of is all people want. And nowadays it generally is not, you know, nowadays, you know, what people will want and expect is, is that an organization has done some very deep internal work, you know, and I would apply this to other issues of identity as well beyond LGBTQ that an organization, you know, has, um, you know, has looked at their policies and their programs and their culture um, and yes, their leadership, but not only their leadership. And so I think like that's a critical piece that you want, you do need and want to bring people in with lived experience, but you also want to make sure that the climate and the structures of your institution are ones where that person can actually feel like they belong. That's a really important um, thing to pick up on. And I would love to sort of hear um, more thoughts on that one, because I think that there's something about what does it look like? Um, it's not so much only welcoming people who have been historically marginalized into our table, our room, our decision-making process, but really what is it that the institution needs to look like? What does it need to unlearn? What does it need to do differently? How does it need to be different in order to be a place where everyone feels welcome? They don't feel like they're being brought into someone else's house, right? That they're, it, it's, it's really something that they can own as their own, feel as their own and feel as intended for them. Um, we know that all of us sort of makes pretty quick judgments, you know, when you get into a new place or a new space or a new society, you know, you sort of look around, it's like, is this, is this place for me, right? Or is this place for someone else? And am I a visitor here? So just changing that whole fundamental dynamic. So if there are examples of that, you do, it's such a good, it's such a good point to raise. But if there are examples of that, I think there are a lot of people who might see that, but might maybe not know how to do it um, or what it looks like to how, how they need to be different um, in those, in those ways. There's a there's a way in which structurally um, we'll have to lean into whether we're ready and courageous and brave enough to engage in subversive philanthropy, because there's a way in which we are set up culturally within philanthropy spaces to go with what we know, to trust what we've already seen, to rely on strategies, evaluation, assessments that have served us in the past both because we're coming through a pandemic that has caused us to see things we have never seen before, even though they were right in front of our face. And because people are coming out of those conditions of suffering and triple threat with new expectations for what it means to build a world where they are fully included, we are going to have to change. This is not a time where we can like come through COVID and then just say, let's get back to business as usual. So what is our commitment to reinventing, reimagining, being curious about new ways to do philanthropy is the very first question. Because if the, the solution is growing and moving on its own steam and the circles that we come in are not willing to meet it, we're still at an impasse. So that's the first thing. Culturally, where are we open to change? And then once you're open to change, how are you listening? Because for us, there's a very white centric view that often is unacknowledged in the context of many of the Jewish institutional spaces that we navigate. And philanthropy is no different. If the assumption has been historically that when we're talking about poverty, we're talking primarily about immigrant communities, Russians, Israelis, you know, folks who are in Haredi communities, and this is not what the face of poverty looks like. When we walk in the door, we are up against that history before we even open our mouth. There are ways in which we also have to reimagine 
who is coming to the table and in what condition and what is our historic blindness cause us not to be in a position to be ready to give to and how can we get ourselves as philanthropy ready for that gift not just how the person coming in the door can be welcomed into our shop it's it's a twofold relationship exchange i think that we're headed to in this next moment and i would love for philanthropy to set up more conversations like this one where we can be reflective about our historic practices and who those practices have included and who those practices have left out and then to how do we find the people because if it's not a both and in terms of the work the emotional physical um spiritual labor that we have to do in order to move in jewish spaces is almost just too much once you're coming from a place already of having survived. So I would love for that both and to be a part of how we approach things. And, you know, outside of subversive philanthropy, I think there's a way in which rethinking the assumptions about what a solution is, is also necessary because a solution isn't always writing a check. A solution is also deepening leadership. A, so, a solution could also be getting more proximate to communities and making sure that those communities are fully integrated in all things that we call Jewish. Um, a solution could also be going into things that already exist and affirming and valuing and adding dignity to those spaces as opposed to saying that the only place we have value is when we're integrating and assimilating. There's all sorts of different ways in which a resource that, that turns over, flips, puts poverty in the tumbler and comes out with new solutions could look like. And I think we have to be curious and brave about it because if we go back to doing the same things we've always been doing, we're gonna get the same solutions. Yep. No, it's so, it's so well said. It reminds me, um, some of you know the work of John A. Powell, who is um, a professor of law, African-American and ethnic studies at um, UCAL Berkeley. And um, he has a very powerful way of um, saying that as well, which is that it's not, the response to othering is not saming, it's creating belonging. Um, and that's a very different thing. It's not to bring some an other into and create same, uh, but what does it mean to create a different a different reality um, that that is belonging and that's very hard to do it's very threatening um, to do so no helpful Lonnie did you want to say something yeah just to to add to I that that piece is certainly resonant in terms of of not wanting people to be the same and I, I alluded to that before I, I I think that to to layer on some of what the ask is around philanthropists and to to bring to light um, you know, the issues that Yavila and Edith brought up around how exacerbated the inequities are and how uneven this, like, this crisis has been for people, you know, to know that the stock market's been riding high and yet we still have, throughout COVID since April, and yet we still have some funders who are, who are not in, in industries that have been impacted negatively, right? Like there are some that have been certainly, but there are, there are many who aren't and who are saying there's scarcity, there's, we're worried. And like, we actually know that that's not the case. And so to then ask like, how right now do we need to be responding to, to like just seeing mass basic needs, you know, in places where we're dealing with food insecurity and housing instability and homelessness and walls closing in and including mental health in that picture, please. I mean, what Edith was saying, what Yavila was saying, people on the margins have no place to go. And many, many are at home and not sheltering comfortably as, as Edith said, and like in really risky situations. And so yes, investing in that and doubling down in that but also making sure that we don't slip into a place of basic needs. The, the, we've had, we had funders early on in COVID that pulled out of our systems reform work around family justice. And people who said to us, yes, your movement building work and you're helping other organizations work, of course we have to make hard decisions, right? But if we're gonna survive as a network here, learning from each other, we have to continue to invest and you talk about like investing in leadership development. We haven't like in the last nine to 12 months, we haven't been, I mean, it was hot topic to talk about like, how could we invest in leaders coming from communities that are on the margins and now no one wants to hear about it. And, 
And so, right, like, and so, yes, we have needs that are crisis relief and mental health for sure. And we need to turn to turn people towards the future and remember that, like, you know, coming out of this, those basic needs are still going to be there. This is going to be a slow recovery for those who've been impacted in a really tough way. But also, we're going to need to turn to saying, okay, we know that holistic approaches are important. We know that you know, community alongside anti-poverty work, alongside systems reform works. And we need to double down on that and not, not forget the upstream work that's going to be vital for all of us. Yes. Um, and to, to turn back for a moment to um, where we were, I think, maybe two threads ago um, about, about leadership and investing in leadership and investing in bringing in people with lived experience. I also want to kind of share a caveat, which is that it often takes a really long time. And I think um, organizational leaders who are not part of whatever that sought identity group is, um, in my experience, often get frustrated that things don't turn on a dime. Um, I mean, like at Kesha, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a call from, you know, the a straight rabbi of a synagogue who has said, you know, we did a, you know, we did an LGBTQ welcoming Shabbat last week. And this Shabbat, like I expected that there would be a lot of LGBTQ people coming. And, and I've heard, and I've heard the same, like, you know, we had a racial justice Shabbat or, you know, or whatever the program is. And um, you know, a, a, a colleague many years ago said, um, this is a, a, a straight cisgender colleague, he said that he reminded himself over and over that um, not for all queer Jews, but for many queer Jews, the relationship with the Jewish, with the mainstream Jewish community is akin to a relationship between someone who has been abused and someone who has been an abuser and is no longer an abuser. And is, and is conveying the message, things have changed. It's really different now. Look at all of these ways that, you know, my, you know, the way I act towards you and the dynamics of our relationship and, you know, the structure of our relationship. Look at all of the ways in which they're different. But for the person who, you know, is coming off years and years, if not generations and generations and a lot of vicariously acquired memory of, of, of abuse and experience of oppression and injustice, it takes a long time to, to trust the new reality. Um, and so I, I would just uh, kind of urge everyone to, you know, to remember that and to remember that in terms of making these investments, whether of time and or of funds, um, they really need to happen over the long haul. It, it's so true. There's one question in the chat, which I'll read out and then I'll let folks kind of make closing remarks out. So I can't believe this, our flew by, um, which is what does it look like for Jewish philanthropy to be informed by the perspective of people with lived experience and to do this without being extractive, exploitative, or tokenizing? Um, so as you all want to incorporate that and, and think about a few final thoughts, I mean, one thing that I started to hear on this call is that it's really taking a holistic look at almost every single step in the process. So even things like sourcing, who is in your network? Who are you, where, where are you sourcing new grantees and new ideas from? And um, when you think about data, like do we know who we're not counting? Do we know across the spectrum of different ways to know that a program is working? How do we think about that? So, you know, there's sort of the tyranny of the RCT um, and a random control trial to prove that a program works, but we also know that not everyone, especially people with um, undercapitalized organizations or community-based organizations, they don't have the money to do an RCT. It doesn't mean their program doesn't work, but they certainly don't have the money to do that. So if an RCT is a gate in philanthropy, we know that that already is going to sort of leave out a whole groups of people, you know, in terms of whose wisdom matters and how do you get to the right answer um, and not get to the wrong answer by not including people who are most proximate. So it was almost at every single level um, of, of activity. But let me let me turn back to, to the three of you. Maybe we can sort of go in reverse order um, just to sort of take into account a little bit of um, what does it really look like for philanthropy to be informed without being extractive? I think it's a great question, but also I want to give each of you a chance to give us your your closing thoughts. We could do this for quite a long time. Unfortunately, we don't we don't have that much. So, in terms of of your question, um, you know, it, 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 it's 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 hard to do. Um, I mean, there's not a formula that I can give you. Um, but what I can say is. 
um, you know, I feel like this is an obvious thing, but too many people don't practice it, um, is, you know, make sure that when you're reaching out to someone, you know, you know, who has an identity that you want represented on your board, um, you know, that you be transparent that that's a piece of that. You don't pretend that that doesn't exist and that you be sure that there is something else, there's some other relevant interest or perspective that that person brings. Um, you know, I remember, you know, some time ago, there was a, an organization that, you know, sought my suggestions of um, someone LGBTQ to bring onto their board. And this is an organization that, um, so it's a small local group, so you won't be able to figure out what it is, don't try. Um, and uh, it's uh, an organization that works, uh, that focuses on Jewish tech study. And I recommended this woman um, and the person, the leader of the organization called me up and he's like, oh, I met so-and-so and she's, she's fabulous. And, 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 you know, and, and, you know, I mean, she knows a lot about Jewish text. So that might, and, and the subtext was she knows a lot about Jewish texts, like she's not just a lesbian. Um, and you might be surprised at how often kind of I hear that kind of conversation, you know, and not only, of course, about LGBTQ identity. So that's, I, I think, you know, a really, a really key piece. Um, you know, and um, I'll, I'll just in 30 seconds, I have time for, for, for Lani and Yavila. I'll, I'll say that um, I think it's very powerful that this panel about poverty um, invited the three of us to speak on it. Um, that the three of us who are speaking on it are people who respectively are representing organizations that work on LGBTQ issues, Jews of color issues and racism and people leaving uh, ultra-Orthodox and formerly Hasidic communities. Um, kind of rather than people kind of working within kind of you know, broader, more mainstream Jewish anti-poverty settings. And the fact that there's attention to this specificity of identities that show up um, in these dynamics, I think is so important. And I very much hope that this is the beginning of further conversations. Okay. Great, thank you, Edith. Lani? I do, I agree with Edith that it's, it's, really, um, it's really complicated. Uh, what, what I would say is when, um, when speaking with people just to build on on what you deep brought you know like not only um not, not interjecting so far about their lived experiences without them sharing and like um philanthropists holding those boundaries uh i i, I see this you know I, I think that in the foundation world it's it's less common um than in uh, and right in the professionalized spaces than in you know working with individual um, supporters who are amazing and like learning those boundaries is really critical. Um, so I, I want to lift that piece up to help um, just help people understand like, oh, you have that experience. Like, I want to bring myself to the table here. Like, this isn't a one-sided conversation, like make it two-sided, engage in that piece of it. And I, and, and um, that's, that's a little thought there. I also think that there's like so many further places we could dig, so many other people in addition to, you know, Edith and Yavila and I that could be speaking on the topics of like, who are the sometimes, you know, forgotten voices to bring in and like, let us not forget the, the communities that are disproportionately impacted by a crisis like this in times that um, are, are vital and, and engaging all of us in conversations together. I think doing this what J JFN did with this panel is an example of that. We could do this for two days, but Yavila, I'm going to give you the last word. Um, you can bring us home. Um, agreeing with Edith that this work takes time and people who have been historically targeted and marginalized cannot pace their survival at the pace of institutional wokeness. They have a, a mandate every single day to continue to live. And in order to do that, they are already being creative and powerful and regenerative in ways that many folks who are privileged do not understand. So I say reach for people where they are and acknowledge that they are already powerful. Slaves, my great grandparents who had nothing but their bodies because everything had been robbed from them in the institution of slavery, knew how to create a moaning circle in the evenings where women would get together and all they could do is just moan in each other's company to try to get out of their body some of the pain of their experience. And it was those moaning circles that helped them to move forward and survive whole and intact physically and emotionally. 
if we had a chance to invest in something like that today, would we even know that it was a moaning circle that was responsible for people in my generations to survive? Or would we be looking for some institution to be able to empower us to be able to get out of our condition? So I say, look for people and be able to invest in people. Dimensions has created all sorts of micro communities across COVID that did everything from resume writing to shared parenting online, to connecting people to, for listening circles, to be able to share their lived experiences so they could get up and breathe another day. There are ways in which we cannot use the same institution structures that we have right now to tell the full story from beginning to end of what it takes to be in a black body and survive. You're going to have to listen for things you haven't been hearing before and reach for people you haven't been reaching for before in order to let people who are on the front lines of the issue tell you what they need in order to get through to this next new day. And I welcome philanthropy into that conversation. Thank you. It's impossible to bring closure to a session like this, and I, and I won't try, but Yavila, thank you. That was a, a very powerful metaphor to leave on. Um, let me turn it back to you, tomorrow to wind us up. Thank you. And you know, I'm not going to try either. This was just so powerful. So I want to thank all um, Edith and Yavila and Lani and Susan for this incredible, incredible panel conversation. I'm seeing the chat, and I'm seeing everybody screaming for more opportunities to talk about this and to have this really just be a start of a conversation. So I hear you and thank you. And we are committed to bringing more of these conversations to all of you. So thank you for participating today and please look out for further programs and important conversations that we will continue to host. So thank you all again and stay well, everybody. Have a good day.